Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. All right. Well, hey, good to be with you guys this morning. We're going to continue the series today called Keep It Light, where we have been talking about the things that we do that, that, that make us carry more weight than God intends for us to carry. Uh, you know, Jesus, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And he says, the way you get the rest is not by just laying on the ground. The way you get the rest is by taking up his yoke, because he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And a yoke was just simply a piece of wood they would put over two oxen, and the oxen would pull a heavy load together. But the interesting thing is, he's not saying that you, you know, you get meaning in life from doing nothing. He says that you find meaning by carrying the weight he's called you to carry. And every one of us in life, we have a specific weight he's called us to carry. And when you carry that weight, you find meaning and purpose. You know, an example is having kids. Kids are a whole lot of work. But man, the reward is amazing. But it's a, it's a heavy weight to carry. And we've all got things in life where we say, man, well, how come they've got it so much easier? Look, you don't compare to others. You say, what is the burden God has asked me to carry? And you carry it along with him. So we've been talking about the different things we do to, that make our burden heavier than it needs to be, that create unnecessary suffering. And today, I want to talk specifically about the weight of lack of self-awareness. So I had this, spoke at a pastor's conference a few years ago, and I had this guy come up to me afterwards, big old dude, and he came up and he said, hey, I don't know about all that psychology you were talking about. I believe the word of God is enough. All I use is the word of God. And I said, hey, I agree the word of God is enough. He's like, but you don't need to be, you just need to preach straight from the word of God. And I was like, look, I absolutely believe that. I completely agree. And I was like, but is it possible that the word of God is a foundation for all truth and all sorts of supplemental things we're learning actually confirm what the word of God already says and it helps put things in context? He's like, well, I don't know. All I need to do is preach the word of God. I was like, all right, whatever. So we keep talking and he says, yeah, my wife. She says, if I don't come back a changed man, she's going to divorce me. But she just needs to submit. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, what's her complaint? Well, she says I'm just too hard-headed. She says I'm just too, I won't listen to anybody, and I'm just too determined to make the church a certain way, and she's done. But, you know, she just needs to get in line with the word of God. And I was like, wow, it sounds, it sounds like you got a situation on your hands there. I kept trying, kind of talking to him, trying to figure out, maybe this guy can figure out that maybe in some way he's responsible for the problem he's facing. But it was all her. She needed to submit to the word of God. And I remember, finally, I was like, well, let me just pray with you, brother. Sounds like you got some soul searching to do. We prayed, but it made me think, you know, every one of us in this room, if we were to talk for a minute, you've got somebody in your life, or maybe you've had a conversation this week, and afterwards, the conversation, you're like, what is wrong with them? (laughs) You ever had, you know, every time your boss, it's like, everything's fine, all the chaos is under control, and then your boss comes in and just stirs up chaos, and you're like, just stay out of here. Let us do what we know how to do. I used to have a boss that was that way. Everything would be under control and he would come in and he would literally stir things up so there was something for him to fix to make him feel important. I go, what is wrong with him? Maybe you've got somebody in your life that you go, man, don't they see that what they're doing is hurting them? Like every time they get in the room and they start having to be right all the time, people just shut down. Don't they see what they're doing to their marriage? What's wrong with them? Or maybe you say, what's their deal? We've all got people in our life, we say that. Maybe some people, you're looking at me going, do, do they not see how they're hurting everyone around them? They're just hurting everyone, and they don't even see, they're completely oblivious to it. In fact, they think people like them. And you're like, actually, nobody likes you, and you're hurting everyone. <laughs> you have other people, and you look at them, and you go, What's, uh, can't they see that they're, they're cutting themselves short of what they could be? Like, they're so limiting their potential. Maybe you've got a son or daughter, and you're like, the decisions that he is making is literally limiting what he could be. I see the potential in him, but he's killing his own potential. And you go, what is wrong with him? And we're going to talk about that today because here's what's fascinating about it. You know how you're saying that about somebody? Somebody's saying that about you. (laughs) 
Exhibit A of lack of self-awareness. <laughs> We've all got some weird stuff in us that we, got, that we think is normal, but everybody else is like, what is wrong with him? Like me, right? So my wife, she is a chill, calm, at peace person. And she'll go to me and she'll be like, why are you always freaking out about everything? Why are you so anxiety riddle? She's like, it's completely irrational. And here's the rational reasons why. I'm like, sweetheart, do you understand it's irrational? So rational reasons will not work for irrational reasons. Does anybody get that? Here's the reasons this and this and that you're worrying about are worried. I understand it's irrational, but it's still rattling me. She's like, why can't you just be like, what? He, why is my husband such a freak? And some of you say it about your spouse, like, why? What's their deal? Why do they do that? We've all got stuff within us that we do that we're like, what is that all about? So we've been talking in this series about how we all have certain things we value. And those things we value, like we've all got like this backpack we're carrying around in life. And we put in the backpack what we think is going to get us what we really want in life. And the things we value are what we give priority to. And Jesus comes along and he says this. He says, guys, I know you're, you've got certain things that are really important to you. I know you're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. He says, look, everybody's worried about that. Even the pagans run after that. And he says, and here's the beautiful thing. He says, and your heavenly father, he knows you need it. So you're, you're freaking out. Like, what if he doesn't come through? And he's like, no, your father, the guy who made you, he knows you need this. But I'm telling you this, if you really want what you're looking for, don't look at those things, the money, the lack of money, what inflation is doing to your retirement account. He says, instead, seek first his kingdom, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things you're worried about will be added to you as well. So we talked last week about the fact that most of us know more what we don't want than what we do want. We say, well, I don't know exactly what I want, but I just know I don't want to be poor. And so you go to somebody and say, well, what do you, how, when, how will you know when you're not poor? Well, I just need a little bit more. That's not a vision for the future. That's running away from something. And, God, and then Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people dwell without restraint. And a vision is simply a picture of what the future could look like. And if you don't have a picture of what the future could look like, if you're just running, you, know, you can run away from something in any direction, but you can only run towards something in one direction. And this is where Jesus says, he says, look, if you, you don't know really what you want, but I know what you really want. So here's what I'm telling you to do. Seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and I'll make sure that you get what your heart really desires. So we talked about what God's kingdom is. It's simply this. God's kingdom is the order of God. It's his order. It's what he values in the order he values it. And it's how we live in harmony with the seen and unseen realities of life. When you get in line with what God values, things just tend to go better. Yes, there's some things that are harder, but when you get in line with, with, his, with his order, you live in harmony with the seen and unseen realities. And I think one of the biggest things that gets in our way as we're carrying this load is the weight of lack of self-awareness. We end up going over and over again, why is this happening to me again? Is there something wrong? Like, and, and, I mean, listen, this is a hard truth, but what is the common denominator in all of your problems? You and me. I'm not a problem in your problem. I got my own problems. But we're the common denominator in all of our own problems. And so one of the challenges that is, is saying, okay, what is the role that I'm playing in making my life more difficult than God intends for it to be? And self-awareness is the way that we come to understand what is it that's driving me? Because here's the reality of it. Deep within you, you are, you're, you're a deep person. Some of you are like, I'm not very deep. No, you're really deep. Every one of us within us, we have a, a bunch of experiences. We have personality traits. We have gifts. There is deep well of experiences and things. And, and King Solomon says this. He says, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water. It's like you're this deep well. He says, but a man of understanding will draw it out. What he's saying here is deep within us, all of us, we are deep people. And if you're wise, you're not just going to look at somebody's behavior. You're going to go, I wonder what's going on behind the scenes that's causing the behavior. Because know this, your response to what's happening around you always comes from what's happening inside of you. And most of what we're doing is on autoplay. Did you know about 97, neurologically, they've proven about 90% of your responses are just 
reactions. Like your body just is in auto, autopilot. You don't think about it. It's just you've got this well of experiences and you go, well, this is how it goes. And this happens. And I do this. And when, I, when this happens, I do this. And that's what Jesus was talking about. He says, look, if it's inside of you, it's going to come out. Jesus said this. He said, for, there, for no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. If you want to know what somebody values, look at what they do, not what they say or think or feel. The fruit reveals itself. You know, this is an avocado. This is an apple. You look at what the fruit is. And he says this, for figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure of his heart produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Now, we use this a lot in reference to sin, but this isn't reference to anything. This is a principle. What's in you is eventually going to make an appearance. That's, right. That's, That's why I've had some people that I've been working with, they write me an angry, drunk text in the middle of the night telling me what a loser I am, and... Then the next morning they say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. I'm like, actually, you did mean it. It's just when the filters were gone, it came out. But here's the thing. At least it's out now. We can deal with it. And how many of us, you've, like, you've got all this stuff building in you, and all of a sudden, in a moment of weakness, it comes out. Because what's inside you will always come out. And typically, it comes out in our words or our actions. What's inside will always make an appearance. So what's super important to figure out is, What's going on inside of me that's causing this? And, and understand this. This is super important. How you do anything is how you'll do everything. And some of you are going, that's ridiculous. I don't think that's right. Yep. And you've just made my point. <laughs> when I first heard that, I said, I don't agree with that. And you know what my problem is? I'm skeptical of everything. So anytime a new situation arises, how I do anything is how I do everything. I go, is this new information a threat to me? And I don't believe it. I immediately don't believe it. I write it off. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? And, and, and that's, that's one of my, you've got these motivations, this deep well of experiences. And I have a deep distrust of experts. So how I do everything is, ah, no, no, that's, I, I'm immediately skeptical, very resistant of new information. And you're the same way. How you do, like, there's this pattern to the way you do things. And like I said, about 97% of it is just kind of by default based on the past experiences and things that have happened to you and the way you've seen the world. And some of it's a gift, but sometimes our greatest gift can actually be our greatest hindrance. Because if God hasn't redeemed that way that you see the world, you can actually see the world in a tainted and wrong way. So I started thinking, like, what are some of the ways we do things? Because really, when you do something, it's because you're seeking something. That's why Jesus said, you got to seek the right thing. So I started thinking, what is it we're all seeking? Here's some of the things I came up with. Some of us, we're seeking order. This is the way it is. This is what it is. And I've talked to people all the time that they would, I say, would you rather be right or would you rather stay married? And they're like, well, I'd rather be alone and right. And they are. Some people, they're just so determined to have order and it's just, it has to be this. This is the only way it can be. And listen, if you're right all the time, you're not learning anything. Because in order to learn something, you ought to be wrong about something. Some people, that's what drives them. I have to be right. It's like an insecurity that if I'm not right, something's wrong with me. Listen, we all know there's something you don't know. Just surrender to the fact that you don't. That you, know, that you don't know it. Some people, what's driving them is they seek care and nurture. They go into a room and they immediately find the person that needs their help the most. Some people actually create drama so that they can have people to care for and help. But that's the driving thing. I need to feel needed. And the way I feel needed is I seek out people who need my help so I can feel validated. And again, this is a gift in one way, but it can also be a detriment in another way if it's not redeemed, that gift, right? Some people are seeking that. Other people, they're seeking to achieve. I have this friend, and he said this to me. He said, man, you know, a friend of mine got sick, and I was just like, I really don't have time for this. I've got stuff to do. Can you just call me when you get better? Obviously, very different drive here, right? It's like, he's like, I've got to get things done. I can't have things slow me down. And some people, that's the drive that you feel. I'm, like, I'm only valuable if I get things done. Got real quiet in here. 
Some people, their identity is the most important thing, and they want to be unique. And listen, there's a, there's a beautiful thing about that because there's an authenticity to that, like finding authenticity. But man, I've got this other friend, and he just, he's so weird. I'll be like, um, why don't we just have a conversation? I've found through conversation we can actually find answers to problems. He's like, look, I don't call it conversation. I call it conversolution. I'm like, what? And he's like, yeah, because when you converse and there's this space of organic conversation that transpires within the context of authenticity, solutions reveal and appear. And I'm like, whatever, it's conversation. But he's got to put a weird, unique twist on everything. Got a friend like that? Some people, they just, to understand, okay, this is one of my drives. I want to understand. Before I move forward, I need to understand. And unfortunately, if you wait till you understand to move forward, a lot of times you're never going to go anywhere. But that's the drive. But thank God we have people that say, I want to understand. That's hopefully what I do on Sunday mornings, help people understand a little bit better, right? Some people, their drive is stability. Like, just tell me how I can be guaranteed everything's going to be fine. And, and thank God we have a, actually about 40 to 50% of society is driven by stability, which is why when the government says, hey, Let's all just stay at home until nothing bad ever happens again. We're like, okay, it's a guarantee of success and stability, right? And we follow it, right? Except for people like me who don't follow it. Stability is a driving force behind a lot of people, and they'll even take things that aren't true if it promises stability. They'd rather a lie that promises stability than actual stability. Positives and negatives. Thank God there are people that keep society stable, though, right? Other people are seeking fun. Woohoo! If it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. My wife, she's that way, man. She can turn anything and make it fun. She's like, let's make fun out of this. But the negative side of that is sometimes they'll escape when things aren't fun. Just check out and I'm going to binge watch Netflix all day for days on end, right? Other people seeking autonomy and freedom. This is a drive for me. I look at everything in terms of, is this going to limit my freedom? You guys have heard the story of when Pastor Marcus invited me to come on sport at the church. And I was like, uh-uh, nope, never going to work at a church again, never going to work for anybody again. And he's like, well, you know, name your terms. I'm like, there's no terms you can name because you, I just don't want to be controlled. He's like, I'm not going to control you. I'm like, baloney, everybody wants to control me. Oh right? How I do anything is how I do everything. That's what was my driving thing. I love the church. But as soon as somebody says, hey, come on board and let me tell you what to do, I'm like, ah, nye, 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 which is a real problem in my walk with God because he always tells me what to do. And I have to constantly <laughs> surrender to him. I have to constantly surrender against the positives and negatives. And then finally, there's a lot of people just like, I just want peace. I'll do anything for the sake of peace, right? We've all got these things driving us and motivating us. And until we understand what's motivating us, oftentimes we're going, why do I keep getting myself in this situation again? Or maybe you've been working against kind of your natural bent and it's just wearing you out and exhausting you. So how do you figure out what your motivation is? Like, how do you come to self-awareness? This is the way you do it. You pay attention to what you pay attention to. Have you ever noticed you can't control what's interesting to you? I have tried to get interested in different things. Like, I've tried to get interested in golf. I just can't do it. I know some people, though, are like, golf is like the ultimate wonderful therapy. I love golf. I, golf, I, I've tried, guys. I've tried to like golf, but it's just, it controls too much of my day, and you know how I am about control. You know why I don't go to movie theaters? Because I don't have control of the remote. <laughs> I have to sit here with these strangers for as long as the movie plays out, I don't even know how long these dumb previews are going to be. Sometimes I'm like, why you got to put 14 previews before the movie, right? <laughs> I don't have control over it. How I do everything, how I do anything is how I do everything. And the same is true for you. And you look at me and go, what is wrong with him? And I'm saying the same thing with you. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Now, I want to make a distinction real quick because this is super important. Self-awareness versus self-focus. And there's a very fine line here. You know, Jesus, he said this. He was very specific about this. He said, look, if anyone would come after me, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 
For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You go, well, uh, what, you know, I grew up in a Christian tradition where it's like, well, you just deny yourself. You don't think about yourself at all. And, and that is what causes a lot of people to do great harm. Because here's the beautiful thing about it. God made you the way he made you, those unchangeable characteristics. He made you that way for a purpose. And he actually likes the way he made you, but his goal is to make sure you become the fullness of what he made you to be. And some of you, you go, I don't like the way I am. And God's like, hey, who are you to say to the pot, to the clay, who is the clay to say to the potter, why did you make me this way? Like, yeah, you wish you were more outspoken or you wish you were a little less outspoken. And God's like, no, I put that in you. I just want to hone it and sanctify it and perfect it into the fullness of what I made it to be. He made you for a purpose. But here's what happens. Here's the danger of, of self-awareness, okay? My daughter, she got this toy this week. And um, it's really fun. It's this ball that has... See what it does? But what's funny is when kids get this ball, they discover that there's this backwash, uh, jet wash from the engine, right? And they feel the air and they're like... And all the kids are like, throw the ball, throw the ball. And the kids are like. And I think self-awareness can be a lot like that. You discover there's this, this gift, and right, it can be kind of addicting to discover, wow, there's some unique things about me. But the goal isn't so you can go bask in your amazingness. Look at all the amazing things. And some people get so addicted to self-awareness that they're always reading a new self-help book, right? But the goal of self-awareness is not to hold it. The goal, oh, the battery died. The goal, <laughs> the goal is to give it away. It's live. You got it back? Send it back. Send it back. Don't bask in your self-awareness. All right. <laughs> the goal of it is not for you. The goal of becoming aware of how God made you is so that you can give it to others. And make no mistake, look, this, this, right here, this, this is what's fascinating. It says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? And this Greek word soul, you know what it is? It's suke. And you know where that word, English and word psychology comes from? It's from that word, your soul. And it's basically the essence of who you are, the animating principle of a human. And he's saying, look, if you're so focused on just driving ahead to get your needs met and not aware of anything God's put in you, it's quite possible to get to the end of the race and never have accomplished and become all that God says you are because you never explored the unique thing he put within you. And make no mistake, this is what it says. It's, just, it's by grace that God saved you. He saved you for a purpose, through faith. And this isn't your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works or anything you've done. God put that in you. It's not because you're so amazing. It's because he's so amazing so that no one can boast. You don't get to brag about what he put in you. Now, this is where it's tricky because look, there's nothing wrong with admitting God made you good at something. In fact, that's humility. Humility is just acknowledging what's real. He says, but you don't get to boast about it. It's what God put in you. So, Because we, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which the Father God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The gift that God put in you that you need to become a little bit self-aware about, those experiences, the way you see the world, that perspective, it's not for you to sit there and bask in it and go, oh, I'm so amazing at this. The goal is to give it away and send it off to others to bless the body. And that's what Paul's talking about when he says this. He says, just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. The goal of self-awareness is not for us to sit around and go, oh, look how amazing I am. The goal of self-awareness is this. God, I'm going to figure out what you put in me and figure out what my purpose is, and I'm going to use it to the best of my ability. And whenever you do that and you steward what God has given you to the best of your ability, everybody benefits. And you know the first place you need to use that gift? Right here in the church. I think about my man Tony over here who's doing balloons for the kids today. He's a balloon... What do you twister there's got to be a it's an artist a balloon artist 
and he brings it in. You'll see him this after, right after church. You'll see him out here. Uh, Robin helps him with it too. They both do it. She's a face painter too. They use this unique gift. That's kind of a quirky gift. But they bring it to the church and the kids, my daughter raves about it. And it's them saying, man, God gave me this love for this and put this love, love in my heart and I'm gonna use it right here in the church. And trust me, some of you guys go, I got quirky gifts. Bring it. We need it here at the church in some way. But if you're afraid, you need a DJ? Oh, currently we need a DJ. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> God put that in you. And it's not so that you can use it on yourself or think you're so amazing. But it's so you say, man, here's who I am. And no, listen, these are the two things. Recognize what's motivating you and what you're gifted at. That's the power of self-awareness. When you recognize, you know how I do everything is how anything is how I do everything. This is why I keep doing things this way. And maybe you need a shift in perspective. Maybe God needs, like, you need to say, God, why do I feel like everything's a threat to me? And you say, well, you've, maybe it's because of what happened here, but I want to show you how I redeemed that for good. And you can reframe that thing. Because remember, everything he put in you that's, that, that's right now is being used for negative, he wants to redeem it and use it for his purposes. The goal is to give it away, to send that gift off, not to bask in the wonder of it. So my prayer for you guys is, hey, think about this. Can you imagine what would happen if you said, man, there's parts of me I don't like, but I'm going to start to look for those parts that God put in me that honestly I do like, or, or maybe you don't even know are there. And listen, you have things in you that you don't know are there. And if you don't know it's there, pay attention to what you pay attention to. But the second thing you need to do is ask somebody around you because they know. They know the thing that they're always going, why, what is wrong with him? What is wrong with her? Is there anything I need to work on? I do this a lot with my wife. Well, she, I don't even have to ask her. She just tells me. <laughs> you really need to work on the way you do this. You do that. And you know what? I could get offended and upset, or I could say, no, you know what? There's something good in me that God wants to redeem by my wife having the courage to share that with me. And maybe the courage you need to have is say, what is it that's, how am I getting my, in my own way? How am I getting in the way of what God wants to do in my life? Because everybody around you knows. Most of them just don't want to tell you. And ask and find out. And, and, and man, sometimes it hurts to find out stuff about ourselves we don't like. But you know what? At least it's out there now. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. At least it's out there now and you can do something about it. You can surrender to God and say, God, I want you to take this from a negative trait and turn it into a positive trait. But first, it, become, it comes with recognizing there's, there's some motivations and drives within you. And when you come to understand that, man, listen, here's what I've found. God will take those things and he will use them. And there's no upper limit. It's like that ball flying through the sky. There's no upper limit to what he can do. When you'll surrender who you are to him, First, you've got to become aware of who you are. But then as you surrender that to him, he'll take it places you never could have dreamed. Do you guys receive that? Yes. That's my prayer for you this week. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you so much that you have put gifts, abilities in us. You've arranged us in the body for a very specific purpose. And I pray for those this morning that maybe they're feeling like they don't have a purpose. I pray that you would just, man, put the person in there. Have, have, let them have the courage to say, what's, you know, what, what's holding me back and what am I good at? And I pray that as they become aware of that, those motivations, but also of those shortcomings, um, what's that verse that says, search me and know me, O God. See if there's any unclean way in me. Lead me in life everlasting. We just pray, Lord, that you would be guiding us in that way. And we thank you, Lord, that you're going to accomplish your purposes. You who began a good work in us will be faithful to bring it to completion. We just thank you for that. If you're here this morning, you've not given your life to Jesus. Uh, the first step to doing that is surrendering your life to him, saying, I'm going to stop doing it my way. I'm going to do it your way, Lord, and get, get my values in line with your values. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer and mean it in your heart, God's going to transfer you out of the kingdom of darkness, set you on a path to the kingdom. Uh, he's going to set you on the path and into the kingdom of light. So we say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Man. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you in the back. I uh, hope this has been an encouragement for you guys. We'll see you next week for part four of Keep It Light. Be blessed. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.